Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. Tonight we're going to have a Commodore 64 night. I was recently given this main board and it doesn't work and I want to try to troubleshoot and fix this thing. So let's get right to it. Alright, so taking a quick look at this board, it is a revision uh, 250407, so it's sort of like middle of the road version of the Commodore 64. These are pretty common, I've seen a lot of these come through my digital basement, and they seem to be kind of unreliable. When Commodore shipped this out, there is a cover on top of this video part of the circuitry, which does a little bit of heat sinking on the VIC-2 chip here, but the rest of the ICs have no heat sinking whatsoever. The SID has already been pillaged from this, but other than the VIC and the SID, none of the chips are in sockets. So most likely I'm going to have to be removing some of these, and I'll get to that in a second. But let's take a look at what happens when I turn this on. So we get a signal, it's NTSC, but we're just getting a black screen. I do have the Commodore dead test cartridge right here. When I put this in, we are just getting power to the diagnostic card, but we're just getting a black screen. If just the RAM were problematic or potentially the color RAM or some other issues, we might get flashing patterns on the screen. It flashes white, which kind of tells you which RAM chip is bad or which data line is stuck low or high, but we're not getting any of that. So in my opinion, I think the first thing I'm going to do is we're going to swap out the VIC-2 chip. Most likely the problem is either the PLA, the VIC-2, or the CPU, but there could be some other issues as well that are causing this issue. So let's uh, pull this out and take a closer look at the board. So this is an unknown board, and I don't know what's happened to it, but let's take a look right off the bat at this. What the heck is happening there? Let me zoom in. What's, what's going on there? Is this like a burn mark or something? Is that trace? Burned and disconnected? Uh, I'm going to pull another board that looks like this and we'll just take a look at exactly what that looks like. Here's another board and I've already removed the chips on this one because this one has a fault and I was troubleshooting. But there is that trace or whatever. It goes under these resistors and it comes over to that pad right there. So that's a little suspect. I'm going to have to take a closer look at that. Unfortunately, it goes under the PLA, which is soldered. So we're probably going to have to remove that chip anyways, just so I can try to figure out what exactly is going on there. I did a quick cursory look at the rest of the board and everything seems fine. This board still has its original back on here and it doesn't look like it's ever been reworked, at least not initially. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try to clean this off. That's a little bit of 99% IPA. There's just a lot of weird flux residue. So yeah, I don't, there's a little burn mark on this resistor. I'm just quite, not quite sure what the heck happened here. There's definitely been a little bit of rework on the top surface. I don't know, if I take out the, the chip, we'll get a little a better idea of maybe if that's still connected. It goes from over here by the RF modulator to underneath there. So I can probably actually flip the board over and just test for continuity really quickly. Oh. Okay, well, I can't easily test because of this. So let's remove this shield. I always take these off and never put them back on anyways. I don't like them. People are going to cringe, but my method for getting these off is I literally just use some of these uh, cutters and I just cut them off. I will not be reapplying this metal shield ever again. So I just go around the entire board and I just like a tin can, just cut them off. These are there for FCC RF shielding. Definitely not necessary for the computer to operate. The ones on the bottom don't provide any kind of heat sinking or anything like that. So you're not, oh, that one's not even connected. That's funny. That one's just up. And there's some on this side. There's one there and there's one in the back. Not quite there. Almost, almost there. There we go. All right, so this should pop off, I think. There we go, and then there will be a couple in the back. Okay, that one already came off, so all that's left is the one on the RF modulator, which I just cut like that. And then this stuff here, thrown away. Okay, so this is the area of the board 
where they did that repair. And there's clearly not been any rework done on the bottom. There's no flux or any issues here. So whatever was done was done completely on the top of the board. All right, so I tested continuity underneath and it's from that pin to the one underneath. I did it on the back of the board and that's pretty crusty looking, but it is still working. There is still continuity through there. So that definitely looks like some kind of a repair to me. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out this VIC-2 chip and we're going to test to see if it works with a different one. That would be the first thing because it's the easiest thing for me to try. Oh, actually, before I remove the VIC-2, I'm going to take out this metal shield. I hate these shields because it prevents me from putting a decent sized heat sink on the VIC. So I'm just going to take that shield off altogether. I don't even have the top cover anyways, so, so I can put a better heat sink. I'm just going to yank it. All right, I'm going to desolder this. It's uh, got a few tabs you have to bend and then you take off the rest of the solder. Use, uh, watch my last video. Oops, sorry, I keep pushing the button. Watch my last video on uh, the, the method I use for desoldering. It's the same thing here. I'm just using a bigger tip and lots of heat. Because that shield. In fact, kind of what you got to do with shields, in my opinion. Well, my camera just crashed and I don't know exactly what footage I lost. So to summarize, I'm removing the RF shield that's around the VIC-2 and I'm using my desoldering gun to just remove the solder and I bent the tabs. So now it's just a matter of getting this thing off. This part right here, but it's still holding fast. So the trick I find is you kind of have to pry it away part a little bit at a time. So Basically, I, okay, there we go. So I'm applying heat with the desoldering iron to the back. Okay, that just popped out. And you just go one at a time. Okay, that's out. Because basically, even though you bend the tabs, okay, we just have one left. It, there's, it always leaves a little bit of solder behind, especially because, you know, my soldering iron is pretty crappy. All right, there we go. There it is, it's out. Nice. So there's two things. This being out makes it much easier to get the VIC chip in and out of the board. And I really like that. It's just a pain when you have the heat shield in the way, or I'm sorry, this RF shield. So that's out. I recommend taking this out if you don't need it, which I don't. All right, let's do some troubleshooting. All right, let's yank this out of here. Oh, that's so easy now. I love it. I hope this is a good Vic because this is an R8 and I like the R8s. The R56s, which are the ceramic ones. Well, the ceramic come in different versions, but the oldest Vic 2s are R56s and they're terrible. Really, really bad picture quality. All right, so here's another one of my machines. Uh, it's, a, it's a working computer, so let's just yank this Vic out of here. And I'm just going to test the Vic I just took out of the other computer in this one. Alright, so this is a ceramic one, but it's one of the better ones. So let's pop this baby in. All pins look good. Just put that in there like that. And let's plug in the monitor. Turn that on. Looking good, okay. Working great. Actually, it's interesting. I think that looks a little bit better than the this one I just took out, actually. Looks a little clearer. I'm just using composite, but. All right, so we've uh, ruled this out as working. So that is definitely not the fault on that computer. So what I like to do when I've checked the chip is I put a check mark on it. So I know it's good. So I put the good VIC-2 back in this board. I'll just do a quick power test on it just to check. It's happening. So there are three things you need to have a working Commodore 64. Well, there's more than three, but there's three of the main chips you need to use the dead test cartridge. You need to have a working VIC-2, a working PLA, and a working CPU. You do not need any of the three ROMs or these two CIA chips. These are not necessary for operation. But keep in mind that one of these being bad can actually prevent the computer from working altogether. Also, the RAM needs to be good, but generally if you have bad RAM, you'll get the flashing um, on this dead test cartridge. 
But if the PLA is bad, for instance, or the CPU or the VIC is bad, you're not going to get the flashing. So we know right away that these three chips are the suspect chips. Now VIC 2 is working. So I think the next step for me is I'm just going to do a couple checks with my oscilloscope, look for clock signals on the CPU and stuff, because if the CPU is not getting clocked or there's a reset, oh, I should uh, check the voltages as well. Check the voltages on the board. I should have done that first, actually. Um, and uh, let's kind of go from there. All right, sorry, I'm checking the voltages. I know it's not easy to see uh, that was the multimeter, but we're getting 12.16 on the 12-volt rail, and this is the 5-volt rail. 4.99 volts on the 5 volts. 4.99, so that's good. And I'm using my home-built power supply, which I know works perfectly. It's a beefy power supply I built myself. It's not using one of the ones that kills. Say the fuse was not in here, you know, we'd have problems with the voltages here, but that is working. The 12 volts is derived from the AC input, the 9 volts AC. That's where the 12 volt signal comes from. So if this fuse were bad, you know, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be getting those. So I can eliminate the power. I can eliminate this power control, this part of the circuit board over here. So I definitely think it's an issue over here. And I'm going to do some checking with the oscilloscope real quick before I desolder these chips. All right, got the scope, which is up here, hooked up. You can't see it on the camera, sorry about that. But I'm going to check some of the pinouts. So here I've looked up the 6510 CPU's pinout. I can just not remember it exactly, even though I've worked on a lot of these lately. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly check the data lines, and I'm going to check the clock signal, which is this one here that's zero in pin one. That's the input of the clock. So the data lines and the address lines, they all need to look good. So I'll just do a quick... A quick test of those where I check the oscilloscope and make sure the signals all look good. And that's with, of course, the computer powered on. And we will kind of start here at the clock signal. Clock is looking good, 1.02 megahertz. Let's quickly check the data line. So pin 37. All right, yeah, uh, let's look at the reset circuit. Reset is this pin here, it's high. All right, everything looks good. Let me just check the reset. If I turn the power off and on, stays low for a second, goes high, yeah. Okay, reset circuit's working good. All right, so everything looks normal, at least on the data and address lines on the computer. Now, next off, I'm just gonna do a touch test and just tech check which chips are really hot. All right, CPU and PL are warm, but that's normal. Vic is going to be hot, but that's typical. Now, the three ROM chips. Now, the computer has been on the entire time I'm testing, and these three, they're warm, but nothing out of the ordinary. Let's check the RAM. RAM's all cool. I need to bust out the infrared camera, the, the thermal camera, if I really want to see differences i've had that like i found a, a rom that was stuck down you know stuck and killed and it was bringing the whole system down and it was very hot but these i'm gonna say touching everything i'm not seeing anything out of the ordinary so so my bet is still that the pla is probably bad on this computer but i think the next step is i'm going to yank the pla and we can test the pla in the other computer all right so this is the pla right here and through the magic of video editing i'm just going to whip this out all right, sorry about all the noise. The damn furnace came on. It's still winter in Portland, although it's a pretty nice day today. Anyhow, PLA, it's out. So everything looks good, and uh, you know that crusty repair job that someone did? I mean, I guess it's effective. I might bypass it and actually run a bodge wire here to here. I could do that on the back of the board, to be honest, but man, super crusty. So I think because yeah, gosh, I need to try to clean this up a little more. A little more IPA, I think, with the brush. Spray a little on there. Well, actually, you might as well get the whole thing now that the PLA is gone. Yeah, I mean, I guess that was an effective repair. It's just really weird. What could have happened that caused this? Maybe someone was replacing this one, maybe someone was replacing these resistors and they scratched that trace or maybe the resistor blew out. I don't know.
Weird. All right, so I realized that that other 64 I was gonna use for testing, the PLA that's in there, it's in a socket, but one of the pins is uh, is bad on that PLA and I have to kind of repair it by soldering it back on. So I don't wanna remove it from that machine it, since it's working. So I have a different one here and this is the PLA and they've swapped it around. You can always tell the PLA because it says U17 on the motherboard. So do keep in mind they've swapped it around so I'm just giving this a quick test. Yep, looks good. Okay, this one's working. So I'm gonna put this PLA that I just took out of the other machine into here and see if the PLA works. So we'll just gently pull this one out of the socket. This was another Commodore 64 that was also bad. And I honestly don't remember what was wrong with this one at this point, but this is a later 250425. Uh, the one that has all the timing circuitry around the VIC just reduced to one little 8701 chip, which is nice. These offer really good video output quality, but that chip can go bad. It's under a heat sink here, this little silver one. If that goes bad, the computer doesn't work at all. So this is this, the PLA I just took out, and here's the one I removed from the other board. So I cleaned up the, the legs a little bit. So let's stick it into this socket. All right, let's turn this on. Look at that, dead. Dead, dead, dead. So I bet you that I'll put a socket on the other motherboard and put a new PLA in and it'll work. So let's just, uh, just pull this out one more time. Problem is with these chips that you've removed from a board the chip legs are very short. So here's a PLA that has the original legs on it and they are much longer. So what happens is they solder this on, they actually stick it in and then they cut the legs off the bottom. And that's because these boards, when they have that heat shield thing, RF shield underneath, they cut the legs so they not, aren't too long and uh, aren't gonna short out. I mean, there's a piece of cardboard there but the cardboard is all that stands. So I'm just gonna hold this down in the socket, turn it on. Yeah, we're getting nothing, nothing at all. So very failure, very common failure point on Commodore 64s. So I'm just gonna pull this out. I'm gonna draw an X on it so I don't confuse these chips. And let's put a socket in that other board and try this known good PLA in that one. All right, so I'm just gonna leave the little bodge wire because it seems to be working. And we'll put the socket in. Does it have any bent pins? No. You have to be careful when you insert these sockets. If you push too hard, because these holes aren't, say, cleared out enough, you can actually like damage the socket where you push the little contacts right out of the plastic. But that looks good. Gently flip this over. I'd already cleaned the back with some IPA. So what you do, put the new socket in the board and you solder one pin on each side. And you don't wanna do more than one because what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick the board up, I'll turn it around so we can see better. And I'm pushing up on the socket. So now I melt the, the single pin on one side and then I push the socket into the position. It actually, it wasn't all the way into the, uh, it, was, it was lifted off the board slightly. And now we're gonna do the other side, give it a push. Yep. And then before we do anything further, we just inspect, make sure it's sitting flat on the board. That looks fantastic. And now we are just going to do the rest of the pins. So unfortunately, if your Commodore 64 is like this one, where all the chips are on the board and they are not socketed, you're gonna need to have desoldering skills. So I didn't show how I got the chip off, this PLA out of the out of the machine on this video. I just did a little editing there. 
but just go check uh, my last video, the one before this. And that one, I give you a demonstration on my methods, and I don't edit it at all. It's real-time removal of chips right off a Commodore 64. But I am using a desoldering iron, which I showed you guys, and I'm using a hot air gun as well to get the little final bits off. Okay, so that is re-soldered, and there's a little bit of uh, leftover flux, so I'm just going to spray a little IPA and give this a rub. Clean it up a little bit. There we go. Looks good now. There's the socket, fully installed. So we're not totally home free. Let's uh, let's just go for broke. Plug the power in, plug the monitor in, and uh, this here is the PLA from the other board, the one with the heatsink installed on it. So we're going to stick this in here. There we go. Here we are, turning it on. Bam! So this is the dead board. It was the PLA all along. Well, there you have it. Bad PLA. Unfortunately, that's a pretty boring fix. It's pretty run of the mill. These PLAs die pretty frequently. This one's dated 1983 and it's a Mostec version. There were some really early ones before that. I don't know if there are any more reliable, but unfortunately these early 80s ones, they are just not that reliable. Apparently, I watched a talk given by the guy who made the Plankton chip, which is the, the replacement that uses CPLD for the PLA, and he said that the chemistry involved in making these old chips essentially self-destructs over time. Not to mention the heat that these run under, which they get very, very hot, especially these older ones and apparently that accelerates or supposedly accelerates their death. This machine, I'm not sure if it died while it was in operation or what the deal was because I have unknown history on it, but nonetheless, it appears that the only problem with it was the PLA because the diagnostics run have run perfectly here. I've let it go through a couple cycles. Everything's good. Unfortunately, there's no SID. The SID is removed, but nonetheless, it's kind of cool to have some other useful parts on here. PLAs, like I said, they're hard to find these days, but there is the Plankton, which I'll link to in the video description as a modern replacement for the PLA. Should work for longer than the rest of this computer does, because there are other parts on here that will maybe eventually die, like the VIC-2, which I don't think there's a replacement for right now. The processor also is a custom version of 6502. If that dies, you're also out of luck. So yeah, there's definitely some chips that may go bad on here, but Nonetheless, uh, it was an easy fix, and I hope you found this interesting. If uh, you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. I'd love to hear your comments uh, in the comment section below. You can subscribe for more videos. And, uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Bye.